Good to see you guys. Welcome. Turn to 1 John chapter 4. That's where we're going to be this morning. Great to be with you. Great to, to sing with you. Great to open the Word of God with you. And it is truly a uh, privilege and an honor always. And uh, 1 John chapter 4 is where we're going to be. Pull out your, your uh, program that you received at the door. There's going to be an outline there that's going to help you follow along the, the message. And uh, take notes because a short pencil is better than a long memory. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for meeting us in this place at this time. And most importantly, thank you for meeting us through Jesus Christ. Lord, be glorified as we navigate your word. May your truth penetrate our hearts and minds. And may it perform its perfect work in and through us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we get to talk about love this morning, and uh, it is a great topic to discuss and something that every culture, every person wrestles with in their lives. And, um, you know, it's always interesting to see love, not just through the eyes of adults, but see it through the eyes of children. And sometimes kids say the darndest things, don't they? So researchers uh, recently just compiled a uh, a study of love with four to eight-year-olds, and they asked them the question, what does love mean and here are a few responses from four to eight year old children uh chrissy age six love is when you go out and eat and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs that's not me i I love french fries it's one of my favorite food groups so uh terry age four love is what makes you smile when you're tired i like that Danny, age seven, love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure it tastes okay. (laughs) Bobby, age five, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas when you stop opening presents and listen. That's awesome. I'm stealing that this Christmas. I'm going to put it in a card and be like, uh, Noel, age seven, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. (laughs) So... Uh, May Ann, age four, says love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him all alone all day. Karen, age seven, when you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out of you. (laughs) Never really experienced that. This sounds cool. Jessica, age seven, you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot. People forget. Last but not least, Rebecca, age eight. When my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Is that awesome? Um, This morning, I'm going to ask us to become childlike in our approach to the topic of love. This morning, I'm going to ask us to not be so adult when it comes to this topic that is so important, because I think... Um, we've, we've probably become too professional in, in, in the topic of love, and we need to become more amateurs. Do you know the word amateur literally means a lover? And you think about amateur athletes compared to professional athletes. You know what I love about amateur athletes? They love it, do it because they love it. Right? They don't do it because they get a paycheck. Perhaps that's why college football is a lot more exciting than professional football. See, the amateurs still scream, and they still cry, and they still go crazy, and we need to become like that as those who are created to love. But we can't divorce the topic of love from God. We live in a culture, in a world that is trying to do that, and this morning from 1 John, John is going to present the argument that without God, there is no true love. And so we turn to 1 John chapter 4, and the apostle of love does it once again. Brings us back to this important topic that he's already dealt with a couple times, but now he deals with it in, in like, like the most amazing fashion. This is the apex of, of the topic of love. And I would, I would venture to tell you perhaps that This is the fullest treatment of love found in the Bible. The verses we're going to read. Now, I'm going to tell you Song of Solomon talks about love. And if you don't know about Song of Solomon, it's basically the Bible's sex manual. 
Now, some of you are like, oh, I want to read it now. Wait till later, okay? You can look at it later. Uh, but it doesn't talk about the kind of love John talks about. Some of you may say, well, what about Paul, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter? Well, it gives us kind of what love should look like, but it doesn't root us in some of the foundation principles of love. This passage this morning is the fullest treatment of love found in the Bible. 1 John chapter 4, look at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Now, some of you with maybe Baptist roots automatically started singing the song in your head when we started reading this verse. Beloved, let us love one another. You know, let's stop right there because I don't want to go into... So for some of you, that's nightmare territory, right? But it's interesting, like, you know, certain faith traditions have, have taught this in a song form, and some of us have never been able to shake it. You know, along with your favorite journey song comes this, right? And yet, profound truths are to be found in this section of Scripture. See, John's already talked about love, chapter 2, where he talks about Love is evidence of your fellowship with God. He's already talked about love in chapter 3, that love is evidence of your sonship, uh, uh, that you're a child of the king. But here, like I said, is the fullest treatment of the topic of love because he deals with the most important topics. And so I'm excited to dive into this passage with you. Three major points we're going to look at this morning. The first of it is this, the origin of, of love the origin of love what we have to realize is that in verse 7 and 8 john gives us this incredible theological treatise he basically deals with the topic of love and says you really cannot discuss the topic of love apart from god why because at the end of verse 8 god is love see john loves the this imagery he talks about god is light right he talks about god is life he talks about god is love these are important topics to discuss but in our world you mention love they don't understand real true love they often understand the first blank in your notes superficial love superficial love see the idea that we were created to love is true the idea that we have the capacity to, to have these feelings, these emotions, this, this innate sense of, wow, I was created for something more than my job and my hobbies and this and that. We have been created with the capacity to love. The problem is most people only experience a superficial love. A love that is often understood in selfish terms and or sexual terms. How easy is it for people to fall in and out of love? And that's usually based on what the other person or other partner in the relationship gives them or doesn't give them. See, this is a superficial love that is based upon response. And so what we have to understand is that though people are created with the capacity to love, it is a love that falls falls far short of what God has designed us to experience. Am I telling you that people who don't know God don't love truly? Yes. Because here's why, and I'm going to make this argument as we look at the passage. If you don't know God, who is love, who is the source of love, you cannot truly experience that which you were created to do and be. 
So I'm not discounting people's feelings and emotions, but I will tell you that it is a false love. John does not want us to live in the realm of the superficial. He wants us to live in the realm of the supernatural. This is the biblical concept of love. Supernatural, literally meaning above that which is natural, that is, that is beyond us, that could only come from God. And so God's love and His love for us is different than anything the world could ever offer. So we look at verse 7 and 8, look at it again, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. If you don't have God, you don't have true love. Because I would tell you that the, the objective of true love is ultimately to glorify God. If you don't have God in your life, what desire is there to glorify Him in the first place? That's why when it comes to good works, I'm going to tell you that good works without an objective to glorify God are nothing in the end. The Bible makes that argument. They are nothing but filthy rags. See, at the core of true love is a desire to glorify God. Why? Because he's the originator. He is the the one who is love himself. This is his essence. This is how he operates. Love has everything to do with his activity. It's not like love is a part of God and then there's all these other characteristics. Love is his essence and every activity God does is loving activity. If he creates, it's loving creation. If he, if he rules, it's loving rules. It's, if it's judging, it's loving judging. Everything God does is about love. So we use the term in the church, agape. We're familiar with the term agape. Write that down, A-G-A-P-E. It's a Greek word. I promise I won't give you any more Greek lessons today, all right? But agape is a unique word because in the Greek culture, the culture in which the the New Testament was written in, three words are used biblically. Eros, which is erotic love. Philea is brotherly love. And then there's agape, unconditional love nowhere in non-biblical literature do you find the term agape because the greeks didn't believe in agape love they only had eros and they only had philea so now the biblical writers had to come up with a word so it's unique to think about the fact that they introduced into the greek world a a type of love that was unfamiliar in the greek culture Why is this important? Because if you're going to introduce a word and say, we want to make this a part of our vocabulary, you better be the one that makes that word beautiful and full and enriching. What a a mandate, right? To, To say, we want to introduce a new word into our culture, and we're going to model what that word looks like. So now you see the impetus of how important this is. See, eros love is is all about take. Philea love is all about give and take. Agape love is all about give. And it is a type of giving love that creates value in its object, whether there's any intrinsic value there or not. Meaning, I'm going to give, and I'm going to give, and I'm going to give whether or not I get anything back. Do you understand the ramifications of this, of of how important this is in a culture that tends to be very selfish, that tends to be very self-centered, that tends to be very self-focused? The Bible says you are called to model a love that is unlike most of the stuff you're going to experience out there. And it is all about giving. And the question is, before we go any further... Are you ready to enter a realm of living where you give and give and give and you may never get anything in return and you're going to be okay with that? I mean, if I did that for all the the weddings I performed, I wonder how many couples would actually get married, right? Because oftentimes what is exchanged right there at the altar in these vows is, you know, her or him saying to the other, you know, I'm really looking forward to you to make me happy the rest of my life. And I'm sitting there going, oh, this thing's doomed. Right? Because it's not, 
we, that is not an expectation none of us can live up to. What we have to understand is that there is a type of love that originates from God that gives and gives and gives and there's very little expectation of any in return. See, love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God and the one who does not love does not know God for God is love. So you see what he says here. This is a tall order. This it could be an insurmountable task. But you can do it. You want to know why? Because if you're born of God, you have his nature. If you're born of God, you have his spirit. So what you deem impossible, he says, no, no, no. There is no impossible with God because you have the very life of God dwelling within you. What's tough is the practice of this. Amen? What is tough is saying, I'm going to give and expect nothing in return. Because the moment you expect something in return is the moment it is not agape love. Why? Because God is love. See, feelings come to us, but agape comes from us. Feelings are passive and receptive, but agape is active and creative. Feelings are instinctive, but agape is chosen. It involves not just the heart, but the mind. It's who God is. He's a spontaneous, self-giving God. And it doesn't matter whether the recipient of that love is deemed worthy, because... Notice how he frames it in light of the gospel, the cross of Jesus. Now, good theology tells us that none of us deserve the love of God. Amen? I know some of you have a hard time saying amen to that. Because we think we're deserving creatures. And perhaps that's why we do such a horrible job at loving not just God, but each other. But when you understand that you didn't deserve his love and yet you got it, how that should spur us to be such loving people. So two blanks I want you to fill in as we finish out this section. Number one, God-based love is evidence of salvation. And God-based love is evidence of intimacy. Notice the two phrases that John introduces here. Anyone who loves like God loves is born of God. So there's evidence of salvation. And number two, and they know God. There is this idea that it's not just intellectual knowledge or assent. It's a, it's, a, it's a knowing that involves the heart that really has to do with intimacy. God saves us to, to be intimate with us. God saves us to, to walk daily with us. God saves us so that we now have this reciprocal relationship where we are able to abide in Him and Him and us. And, and we grow with this loving knowledge of our God. And it just spills out in love. That's why verse 8, the one who does not love is evidencing the fact that they don't know God, so they're not saved or they don't have an intimate knowledge of him. Do you see how important this is? So now that Baptist song really takes on a, a whole different meaning, doesn't it? Not just a catchy melody, but now an imperative for every follower of Christ to embrace. C.S. Lewis described it this way. He said, God's love, write this word down, is gift love. Gift hyphen love. God's love is gift love. In God, there is no hunger that needs to be filled, only plenteousness that desires to give. This kind of love enables us to love those who uh, to us are naturally unlovable. Question, do you have any unlovable people in your life? Because the moment you start thinking about them, those are the people that God has brought into your life for you now to practice unconditional love toward them. They're not a sore, they're not a sore in your side. They're not a mistake. They're not just given to you to make your hair gray and get all stressed out. People who are difficult to love is evidence of God working something in you rather than in them. Amen? Do I need to say that again? Okay, let's say it one more time. The, peop, the difficult people God has brought into your life is more for you to learn how to be an unconditional lover than anything about them. Why? Because this is what the gospel shows us. Notice how 
John now shifts gears and tells us in verse 9, By this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Lest we kind of wiggle our way out of what is uncomfortable, lest we wiggle our way out of what we know we are called to be accountable to, John says, never forget the cross of Christ. There is the monument to the kind of love that we are to demonstrate. See, if you forget Jesus and the cross and you don't live a cross-centered life, you really do not know how to love other people. Every day you wake up and God says, look at the cross. And when that cross melts your heart because you have received something you didn't deserve, now you're able to go out into the world and love people that don't deserve your love, but they need it. Why? Because look how God has loved you. See, we forget about the cross. We don't understand the nature of love. This is why John puts it front and center for us to look at. Here is the supreme revelation of love. There is no greater gift that God has given because there is no greater gift possible for Him to give than to give Himself. And I thank God He's not just a talking God. He's a, he's a loving God. He's an acting God. He's a doing God. He's a serving God. And did he have to? No. The moment you shift into deservedness is the moment you lose sight of the fact that God is love. Did you know that no other religion, no other faith system in the world teaches this doctrine that god is love no other system buddhism there's no such thing as a personal god and all love is is whatever you personally experience in your life well who wants that and islam doesn't teach that god is love as a matter of fact you say god is love in to a muslim that is a disrespectful thing to say about allah See, in Islam, God is merciful, but He is not lovingly merciful. Only Christianity speaks of a loving God who is personally involved in His creation. Wow! The fact that we have each and every day an opportunity to live in this realm where God creates and He rules and He judges and He does it because this is the dominant expression of who He is. Wow! Now this is not to say that God's loving activity is, is tolerant of all of our choices and our behaviors and et cetera, et cetera. No, no, no. The opposite of love is not hatred, but it's indifference. And this is why God has to act in this world and He creates boundaries for us to live in. I don't just let my children do whatever they want to do and the moment I put my foot in to discipline them, someone steps up and says, well, that's unloving. No, it is unloving to not do something that needs to be done. And I thank God that He has stepped into our realm to do something that needs to be done. He didn't have to do it, but He does it. And what does He do? He offers His Son to do two things. Number one, to offer life, and number two, to die in our place. Two blanks there, living love and dying love. Notice how John talks about this in verse 9. He says, God has sent His Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Isn't this awesome to think about the fact that Jesus came to bring us life? You can look at the the Gospel of John chapter 1 for more on this. In Him was and is life. Because we think we know how to live, but we don't. And you know what Jesus did? He came to show us really how to truly live because there's really no true life apart from Him. And so there's a living love that that Jesus brings into the world. He came into enemy territory on this search and rescue mission. And He came to show us that apart from Him, there's really no true life. Kind of like Matrix. You remember 
when Neo finally got plugged into the system and he finally understood what living was all about, right? Like, God is kind of like, the, this is the amazing thing about theology and movies. It's like some of you are like, I need to rewatch that. I think you're right. That we need to get plugged into the system to see what the real world is really like. And that's what Jesus came to do. Could we say he's Morpheus? No, nah, I wouldn't go that far. But we need to understand that God came to give us life, but that life cannot be experienced apart from the second point, death. See, God did not send his son into the world to live. He sent his son into the world to die. And it is through his death you and I have life. Look at verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God. Don't miss that. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Meaning, there is holy divinity and there is sinful humanity. And what Jesus did as the mediator between God and man was appease the wrath of God that is his loving anger towards that very thing that is an offense to his nature. See, propitiation is a big theological word that basically means Jesus stood in our place and took the wrath upon himself that you and I deserve, but he took it for us. And now in Christ, here's the good news, God is not angry with you. Don't we need to hear this? So many people in the world see God as an angry God. And yet it's in Christ that that anger is appeased or assuaged because of Jesus. And that's why on Golgotha, some 2,000 years ago, the sky turned black. People averted their eyes, didn't look upon him who at that moment took upon himself not just the sins of the world, but bore the wrath of God for us. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in his humanity, this, this God-man, Jesus, in his humanity experienced momentary separation from God the Father because God the Father, so pure and holy, could not look upon what the Son was experiencing for you and I. Now that we're propitiation, it's like, Whoa! Because we are not good people. We are not loving people. We deserve death. We deserve God's wrath. We deserve hell. And yet God says, let me and my loving activity come down into the world and create something that needs to happen because you can't do it yourself. What evidence of love God has shown us. Think about this. Love takes the initiative. Love satisfies justice. Love pays the debt. There's no way we would look at a murderer like the guy in Colorado who went to the theater and shot up all those people or anyone who took innocent lives and just said, you know, just wave a magic wand and just forgive. No, there is justice that is demanded. See, passing over wrongs done that need to be paid for is not justice and yet there is a cosmic crime that has been committed by humanity where we have rebelled against our creator we are disobedient toward the one who's designed us and we think we're going get to get by okay on our own no see god's love is for the unlovely god's love is for the rebellious God's love is for the disobedient. God's love is for the stubborn. God's love is for the ungodly. God's love is for the selfish. God's love is for the blasphemous. God's love is for those who didn't want him, who hated him, who didn't care for him, who verbally abused him. God's love is for fill in the blank. This is not how you win friends and influence people. But this is how you magnify a great God who stepped in for us. And don't you dare come to me as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus who has experienced his salvation and say, I can't love so-and-so because of poof, the cross puts that to shame. 
my wife, my husband, my friend, my daughter, my son. No. You love and you give and you give and you give and you look forward to the day God rewards you for your faithfulness even when nothing may be reciprocated on earth. Amen? I need to know you're still with me on this because we are in territory that only God can work in. We live in a world, we live in places, our own lives, where it makes this kind of love difficult. But just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's impossible. And I'm going to tell you right now, you may not love perfectly, but loving imperfectly is better than not loving at all. Amen? This is why we as a church keep the cross of Christ before us. This is why in a culture that people say the cross is cosmic child abuse, we shouldn't talk about the cross. How dare you talk about some heinous theology that teaches that there's a son of a God and we crucify him? We don't need the cross. Oh, we need it. And the very fact that you would say, you general, not just you, somebody here, but would say we don't need the cross, is the, that's just a lie of the enemy. We celebrate the cross. We sing about the cross. The cross is our confession. And now the love that is derived from that is now our act of compassion towards those who, who desperately need it, just like we desperately needed it. The Bible doesn't paint a good picture of humanity. But I'll tell you what, that all changes when a loving God steps in and changes the story. The drama is different now with Jesus. And I thank God for that. How about you? You guys excited about that? And so I'm going to tell you right now, the deeper you go into the meaning of the cross, the greater our love for Christ will be and our greater act of concern for one another will be. And perhaps we don't love as we ought because we lose sight of the cross of Christ. Tim Keller says it this way, the gospel is that Jesus lived the life you should have lived and died the death you should have died in your place so God can receive you not for your own record and sake, but for his own record and sake. John Stott says, For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. Listen to that. The essence of sin is man substituting himself in the place of God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God, and puts himself where God, where, um, let me start again. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be, but God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. While the cross is not a pretty picture, it is the most majestic example of love to be found anywhere. Amen? And so, we have this God who is love, who shows us His love, and He demonstrates His own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ dies for us, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. So what does this mean in our lives practically? Point number three. The perfection of love. God's objective in saving you from your wretchedness. God's uh, objective in saving us from our rebellion, from our disobedience, from our selfishness. Fill in the blank, right? Whatever word you want to use. Is to perfect His love in us and through us. And this is where the church is failing to be the church. Because I will tell you, love is the most powerful apologetic. You've heard me say that before, I'm going to say it again. You don't debate people into the kingdom. God's not going to say, how did you get here? Well, boy, Scott Morgan argued me into a corner. And now I'm here. You know, I'm here because, boy, my son-in-law, 
he just articulated the arguments for Christianity to such a point I'm like, surrender! You don't go to heaven apart from any deep inner transformation that has been experienced because you see the beauty and majesty of Christ crucified and what he's done for you. You don't get there by argument. You don't get there by debate. You don't get there by eloquent speaking. You get there because of a heart that has been changed because God has stepped in and showed you your fallenness and his greatness. Jesus is the answer. So love now in the life of those who claim to follow Jesus is the most powerful apologetic. That's why Frederick Nietzsche would say, you know, I'll believe in your redeemer when you start looking more redeemed. What was he saying? He was saying that I see the church, I hear him talking, but I don't see a lot of demonstration modeling of that love. You know what I, I was encouraged by the other day? I heard someone say, you know, I've been to a lot of churches, but there's a couple churches I can think of. And he says, Missio Day is included where I walk in and I know that people genuinely love each other. I was like, I was like, when should I say this in the message? Should I say it to start, you know, to really kind of set you guys on cruise control? Be like, oh, we're good. I said, no, I'll save it towards like three quarters of the way in. Just, to, you know, after the whole cross thing and like we're rebels. And it's like, you guys are all loving people. Yay. But isn't that awesome that there's an outsider who barely knows anybody here, but when they walked in and they've been here a few times, they notice the love that is shared between us. Keep that going. Because I will tell you, I would rather pastor a church of 100 people that love each other with a gospel love than a church of 10,000 people that are totally disconnected from each other. Okay? Love is the most powerful apologetic. And if someone comes in and they know there is something different here, I'm saying, church, job well done. Because no one's ever going to say, boy, that laser and goat show up on the stage was fantastic. <laughs> I was so moved by that. It's really fun when the lasers hit the goats, right? That's, that's cool. Then we have lunch, and then it's awesome. So, Recent research has shown that the church, now this is recent, this is within the past couple years, research reveals that the church is often seen by the lost as hyper-political, out of touch, pushy in our beliefs, and arrogant. This is the culture talking. Some of you are fine to be fat and happy in your protective little bubble and think, man, Christians have the best movies and music and we're doing okay. Jesus, rah, rah, right? And the world is sitting there going, you're hyper-political, you're out of touch, you're pushing your beliefs, and you're arrogant. You know what Jesus says, John 13? The world's going to know you're my disciples by your love for each other. Well, if the world is speaking to this issue right now, they're saying, church, you're failing. 91% of those people polled, young Americans who do not attend a church, see the church as number one, 91% anti-homosexual, 87% judgmental, hypercritical, 85%, and insensitive to others, 70%. Those are the top four. Something needs to change. And it's not your president of the United States. It's not your elected officers going to Congress. It's not your neighbor who bugs you with loud music till 2 a.m. It's not your coworker who breathes really heavy at their desk when they're really focused. It's not your kid's teacher that you don't seem to see eye to eye on. See, we are notorious for just push, put, pointing the finger. In all love, can I say something to you? You and I are the problem. And I, I, I want to tell you why. Write two words down. It's a phrase. And I, and I hope this gains traction. Gospel gratitude. If 
you allow gospel gratitude to be the fuel of your life, you will have an impact in this culture and you will influence people, I believe, toward Jesus versus away from Jesus. See, Jesus didn't convert everybody he came in contact with, but I'll tell you what, people knew Jesus to be the life of the party. People knew Jesus to bring joy and love and kindness. And you know what Jesus demanded? He demanded people to follow him. And if he didn't, he didn't go chasing after him and say, please! No. People will choose what they choose, but their choosing has nothing to do with you living with gospel gratitude. I'll believe in your Redeemer when you start looking more redeemed. Are we looking more and more like people who are sucking on lemons than those who have tasted the glory of God through the cross of Jesus Christ. And I'm not even going to demonstrate what a person sucking on a lemon looks like. It's not pretty. But we have failed our culture. We have failed our neighbors. We have failed our schools. We have failed our government. And it's on us because we fail to live with gospel gratitude. Do you like that phrase? Because notice... You cannot be grateful without the gospel. And with the gospel, you can't help but be grateful. And this is why no matter what may be going on in our lives, good or bad, there is a gratitude because we know we are saved. Whether you're employed or unemployed, we are saved whether you're married or single. We are saved whether Republican or Democrat. We are saved whether we're black or white. We are saved despite everything else. And that's what keeps us going. So you be ready to give an account of the hope that's in you with gentleness and respect because the culture is going to ask you, why are you so different? And it's not different like you're a weirdo, but it's different because you are a blessing. You're a presence of good. If you left your job, would people weep because they're losing one of the best people that company ever had? Would your neighbors weep because they're missed, you're gonna, they're going to miss the best neighbor they could ever have? Would this church, if it ever disappeared, would the neighbors even realize we're gone? See, when we live with gospel gratitude, when it's gone, it is detected. But when it's present, it's effective. Amen? Two things I want to talk about here. Number one, that we have a responsibility to love. So loving as a responsibility, and secondly, loving as a privilege. You can't love as you ought until you understand how much God has loved you. Gospel gratitude. Write this passage down. John chapter 17, verse 26. Jesus' prayer. If you've ever read John 17, make it maybe your time with God this week. Here is Jesus going before the Father, praying, and he's praying for us. And verse 26, notice what he says. He says before the Father, I made your name known to them and will make it known so the love you have for me and have loved me with may be in them and I in them. See, Jesus says that the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, exists in eternal union with each other, and there is such love that is experienced within that triune God that Jesus says, I want what the Trinity experiences to be something you experience as well. Wow! That's amazing, and Jesus prays for this. Can we experience this kind of love? Yeah. Will it ever be perfect? In eternity, yes, but here on earth, we can strive. Which means, first and foremost, look at verse 10, or 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Re- circle that word, ought. That implies moral obligation. That implies duty. This implies, I don't care if you feel like loving or not. You have to do it. Which seems a little questionable, doesn't it? Because here's our problem. We will wiggle our way out of loving anybody because we'll find a reason not to love them. And I'll tell you what, Paul presents a great argument in the book of Romans. Write down Romans chapter 1, verse 14, and Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Romans chapter 1, he says, I am a debtor to all men. 
All means all, and that's all all means. Amen? Romans 13 says, the only debt you owe to others is love. Twice in Romans, Paul talks about loving people, and that is your debt you owe people. Now, I know we talk about debt in other contexts, right? You owe debt, right? Mortgage, credit card, et cetera, et cetera. But think about this. The greatest debt you owe another person, every person, all people, is to love them as you've been loved. And some of you are going, but I, the Bible doesn't say I have to love unbelievers. What do you think Romans 1 is addressed to? It's those who hate God. You owe them a debt to love them. Well, what about loving Christians? Well, that's where Romans 13 comes in. Isn't it great that Paul talks about both audiences? The debt you owe to people, whether believers or unbelievers, those who hate God, those who love God, is to love them. And how do you love them? You love them as God has loved you. That is our responsibility. And how do we love others? Through kindness and through compassion and through grace and through generosity and serving. And I'll tell you what, the people that are the the greatest nuisances in your life are probably the ones God says, there's your homework. And you know what? Sometimes you love them out of duty and your heart's not there, but in the process of loving them, your heart kicks in and then the feelings come. Sometimes you do what God wants you to do, even though you don't feel like it, you know you need to do it. And then all of a sudden, God shows up because you are now connected via his spirit with his nature and doing what he's done for you on the cross and the gospel. (laughs) Do you see how important this is? That we have an obligation to love each other. But secondly, loving is a privilege. So I want you to know that loving is, is fun. Loving each other is fun. That's why in verse 12 he says, No one has beheld God at any time. So, Pick up what John's saying here. No one has seen God at any time. Beheld Him at any time. But if we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. This is an ongoing work in which the more we love the gospel, the more we love God, the more we love each other, All of a sudden, that love is growing and it's maturing. But don't miss what John is saying. Notice how he starts. He says, no one has seen God, but now in you, when my love abides in you, they're going to see something. That word beheld, beheld, circle it, and write the word theater next to it. Because literally, that's what the word means. You are now actors in this divine drama And every day you're alive, you're in theater class. Every day you're alive, the world is watching you act. Go. And what the world does not see, God, they do see in us some way the manifestation of god in our lives so maybe people don't see god because we are not modeling the love of god or the or the character of god in us they're going to the theater and going what a lousy movie can you believe how horrible that person was as far as an actor right see think of church as acting class I am here as your instructor to say, okay, Tim, you did a fantastic job this week, but I noticed some of your lines, a little, little jumbled. Can you be a little bit clearer in this? And your interaction with Cindy, I mean, it, I mean we're not a Sean Connery level, you know, maybe Ashton Kutcher, but you know, we need to really step it up here. And so I'm not saying who's a better actor, okay? Don't, don't get all offended at me because of that. But we are on stage. The world is our theater and god says now you act and you show the world what god is like wow and so perhaps the world does not see god 
because they don't see a true manifestation of him in us. You, me, we are the visible picture of God in our world. How are we doing? I'll go up to some guy on the street, right, and be like, hey, have you heard of the gospel of Mark? And they're like, what? What are you talking about? Have you heard the gospel of John? And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. But you know what gospel the people read is the gospel of you. The gospel of Steve and the gospel of Linda and the gospel of Scott and the gospel of Ron. That's the gospel people are reading. Are their hearts melting before Christ because they see the gospel of Jesus lived out in and through you? It's a convicting question. I have made mistakes. I have messed up. My acting has been half-ass at times. But what a reminder that as we grow together and His love is perfected in us, we have opportunities to showcase something to the world that deep down inside, the world doesn't offer them and they, they want. That's why Jesus had this, this entourage of people following Him because they were curious, they were intrigued. And I'm going to tell you right now, we are either the fragrance of life to people in this world or we're the scent of death. And my prayer is that we would be given off the fragrance of living and life and love. Amen? So how will you live out the gospel of you this week? How will your acting be this week? How will your interaction with other believers be this week? How will your interaction with those who you have a hard time loving be this week? Do not forget, God has not left you unequipped or ill-equipped. He has given you His nature and He has given you His Spirit through Christ. You are ready. Go live it out. Keeping the gospel before you. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Father, these are, these are tough, tough words. And I know as... I have reflected upon these. My heart is so prone to make excuses and to justify certain behaviors that ultimately don't honor you. And yet you have called me to be an unconditionally loving person. Please, Father, forgive me for the ways I have ignored that call upon my life. And help me un- enter into relationships with a renewed vision. To love people for your glory and to, to exalt Jesus. And I pray that for all my brothers and sisters here today. Forgive us for being a church that has been hyper-political, that has been arrogant, that has been insensitive. And help us recapture the, the theater of your glory in this world and how the church plays such an important role in that. Lord, we are thankful that you are a God of love. And love defines everything you are and everything you do. And we have tasted that love because of the cross of Christ. What a gift. May we keep that before us and live in the, in the, in the light of it and just go forth loving all people unconditionally by your power, for your glory. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great Sunday, you guys. See you soon.